Romans 12, verse one. You can turn there in your Bibles or swipe there. We're, we're gonna have it on one screen right now as well. So here we are, Romans 12, verse one. We're starting a new series, Civilization Reborn. This is a change of pace in the book of Romans. And so brand new series, I hope you've heard about that. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Verse three. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form what? One body and each member belongs to all the others. I just wanna pause there, so can I just say this? I love to say this when we teach who me, and I'll say something about that a little bit bit, uh, later. Your gifts are very important. It's important to discover and deploy them, but your gifts do not belong to you. They belong, first of all, to the Lord, and secondly, to the body of Christ, and that defines our relationship in a remarkable way. So let's read on, uh, verse six. We have different gifts, everyone say different according to the grace given to each of us. Again, it's not about sort of what I wanna do, it's about grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, then do it diligently. And if it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully, and to the reading of God's word, can all God's people say, amen. Well, you may have noticed that, and I know that we, um, we'll see this online, we'll, we'll see a news report, and then we'll go back to the Olympics, or go back to maybe something even trivial online sometimes, but you may have noticed that the world is in a, a, a challenging spot. At times it feels like this wor- world is creaking, we got plenty of challenges in our own country and all the other countries of the world. There's a lot to concern us and it's frankly a miracle that the world has endured this long. Would you say amen to that as well? God has been gracious to the world. Uh, let's assemble for prayer tomorrow night. You'll hear about it. It's one of our regular monthly prayer nights. These have been very sweet times and uh, Sometimes well attended, sometimes not so, but the important thing is we gather and we pray. Uh, Our leaders come along and uh, we're we're so glad to see all of you when you're there as well. I want you to know that we have our staff chapel always the next day as well, and so we sometimes pray through some of the requests. Actually, we always pray through the requests that have been put into that prayer time as well. In my devotions, I came across these words from 2 Peter 2, quite amazing. Peter said, Lot, a righteous man, was distressed by the depraved conduct of the lawless. He was tormented in his righteous soul by the lawless deeds he saw and heard. And I would say, friends, there's a time for that. If you're a follower of Jesus, sometimes there's stuff that goes on in the world and it kind of disturbs your spirit. But if that's all we do, then we're not a very joyful people, are we? And so it's easy in this crazy world to dwell for too long on what is wrong. Romans 12 shows us what is right. There's no better diagnosis of the problems in the world than the early chapters of Romans, but there's no better solution than the cross of Christ and the making of his people the body of Christ. And that's what today is all about. We're gonna move forward together in fellowship. So let's get to chapter 12. I'm gonna suggest, first of all, that chapter one to 11 is especially the doctrinal part, and the practical part is especially chapter 12 Uh, to chapter 16, and that's an over-exaggeration in some ways, but that gives you a good picture of how Romans goes. Matthew Henry, the great commentator, says, the apostle, having, that's Paul, having confirmed the prime fundamental doctrines of Christianity, that's chapter one to 11, comes in the next place to press the principle 
duty. So we go from the doctrines to the duty that we have. Romans 1 verse 11 is one wing of the aircraft, just like today, we've just got one projector working. So Romans 1 to 11 is, is that sort of doctrinal side, but how we live, the bit that we sometimes actually don't do so well, we might get our believing right and our teaching right and our doctrine right, but if we don't live out that doctrine, it's like we've got a blank screen in our life, amen? This is a good illustration today. So belief and obedience go together. What we believe and how we live goes together like both wings of the airplane. Church needs to be balanced in our teaching of the truth, and we do a lot of that, and also in our living out of the truth. That's a very important part of our discipleship. It's at least half, isn't it? And maybe much more than that, how we live is so vital. So verse one, therefore I urge you, brother, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, there's a sense in which the Apostle Paul summarizes chapter one to 11 in one word as mercy. That's the backdrop to the study that we've been doing most of this year, the mercy of God. We thank God for Jesus, the once and for all sacrifice on the cross. We don't need to bring bulls and goats and sheep to church anymore, but if we've received Christ, so we will also live a sacrificial life. So one sacrificial system has ended, the great scholar R.C. Sproul says, but we still have a sacrificial system and it's there in verse one to offer your bodies as living sacrifices. Holy and pleasing to God, this is your true and proper worship. So actually it's not about the screen not working today, it's about our life being handed over to Jesus. And I wanna say this, I thank God for the commitment of this church Exactly one year ago was our last service all together as a group. And you can see, we've still got a few spare seats even on a high Sunday, but we've got another big crowd that's gonna come as well. We couldn't squeeze everybody in, but I just thank God for the faithful service of this church because you saw beyond your convenience, you saw beyond the regular routines, which are very important in life. You saw beyond that stuff, and for the students, the students did a great job. They were already walking in revival, so it went well. Our students were able to go, you know something, I'll go to that service, and we'll go to that second or first family group hour. I just thank God for the commitment of this church. Promotion Sunday reminds us that all believers get involved in the ministry and the mission of the church as living sacrifices. Our service, especially on this day when we celebrate Promotion Sunday, our service to the under 18s is surely one of the most important things we could ever do. We need the whole church to help us to teach and to serve and to protect. It's a big responsibility with the uh, 450 or so, 500 under 18s that will be in our church today. We're gonna even be giving some extra training. Uh, next week after church, we always need to sharpen our skills about how we do serve and how we, uh, how we do it in a wise and a healthy way, this is important stuff. For a civilization to be reborn, if I can put it this way, first of all, we surrender our body and we renew our mind. Somebody say amen to that. Gives me time to take a sip of water. Romans tells how the father sacrifices the son, the son willingly goes to the cross, and therefore you and I freely can live a life of sacrifice, knowing that we're not getting fuel, we're getting fooled or duped along the way. We can totally trust the love of God because he has demonstrated his love to us in Jesus. Isn't that a wonderful truth? We live sacrificial lives because God has laid down his life. He sacrificed the son, the son willingly gives his life, the spirit raises him from the dead. So we are to be living sacrifices. Everyone just say sacrifice. So on those days when it feels like a sacrifice and when we see, feel sorry for ourselves, hey, didn't Pastor Zeke just level us when he shared those couple of minutes under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit about how we sometimes just complain. Sometimes the reaction is, well, how about me? It's like, actually, how about Jesus? And aren't we called to this? Verse two, do not conform to the pattern of this world. Yeah, which is a complainy thing, isn't it? But be transformed by the renewing of your mind, then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. 
Our bodies are sacrifices and our minds need to be re renewed. Who needs the mind to be renewed from time to time? Who gets a frazzled brain sometimes and you know, we get discouraged or all kinds of strange thoughts in the mind, we need our minds to be renewed. Now, the world thinks that our lifestyle makes no sense, that sacrificing makes no sense. And I remember when I became a Christian, when I was sharing my faith and I was very eager to share my faith, I didn't realize you were supposed to be nervous about sharing your faith. The greatest thing that, I, that could happen to me had happened to me, so I just went and told all my friends at school, and many of them believe. We saw about 40 people come to Christ. In the first year, my, my, I was converted. My friend, the punk rocker that got saved, we saw God do some great things. But one thing we, we bumped into a lot was, hey, but I don't wanna give up stuff. There are things that I don't wanna give up. And like, these are just a bunch of 14-year-olds. I remember thinking like, wow, I didn't know you had that much to give up. I didn't know you had that much, that there was actually stuff to give up. But I would say there is part of the Christian life that is about giving up. And it's about laying on the altar and saying it's not about me, but it's about my service joyfully in God working for something greater. What the world doesn't understand is that we've got something greater, something that surpasses anything that this world can offer. And that's why Jesus sacrificed and that's why we sacrifice because there is something greater. This world doesn't always see what we gain and so we are not conformed by the pattern of this world. We're transformed. God does a supernatural work in our lives. Isn't it easy to conform, everyone? We want our peers to like us. We like a little bit of applause. We want to be cool. You know, I had a few moments in the past, just a few moments in the past, where for a brief moment of time, I thought I was cool. And then I thought about, then I thought about that and actually thought, Actually, that's, that's a really bad thing because when you're saying cool, somehow you're sort of comparing yourself with others and you're putting yourself in some way of saying like, I am actually superior to this other person because they're not cool and I'm cool. I got the shades or I got, or I got the shoes or I got the jacket or, or whatever it is, whether it's how you look or what you've accomplished. But actually, when you think about it, I mean, seriously, who in the New Testament tries to be cool? I mean, John the Baptist in the wilderness, was he trying to be cool with his you know, goat hair and eating locusts and honey? Was Jesus on the cross trying to be cool? Was Paul in jail trying to be cool? Well, we must not be conformed any longer to the pattern of this world that is all about what people think about you. You know, social media, it's all about that acceptability and therefore we, we, we know when we're out and so depression rises even though we're trying to find it in that way. We need our minds to be renewed. We need to set our minds on spiritual things. And I wanna encourage you, my friends, if you're faithful to Jesus, when people tell lies about us, we're gonna keep smiling and we will press on. When the flesh rises up, we're gonna walk in the spirit. We don't compete with the flesh. We've died to the world. We're living for Jesus. You know, some people do try to make church what they want it to be. They want it to be for their own convenience. It's about the personalities, the people. It's about the place. It's about the program. And I'm so proud of this church where, where a year ago, after those summits that we had together, that essentially I saw the church dying to ourselves and saying, we're gonna serve the Lord. We're not gonna be conformed any longer to the pattern of this world. We're gonna be transformed by the renewing of our mind. And then we seek God's will. That's the end of verse two. Can you see it there? That uh, his good pleasing and perfect will. We'll test and approve what it is and then we'll delight in the will of God. Do you delight in the will of God? Everyone say the will of God. It's a great phrase. We don't always talk about that. We do perhaps when it comes to guidance. We wanna know God's will. But actually it's a daily thing to know the will of God. For a civilization around us to be reborn, for the spiritual landscape of the community to be transformed, for a revival to come to us, that's gonna require a sacrificial life, a surrendered body, every part surrendered, and a renewed mind, and a desire for the will of God. That's something that I see God working in you, he's working it in me, and isn't that a sweet thing when we see the Lord moving in our lives? Now on the plane, going off to our most recent mission trip to Wales, the drunken couple in front of us, I'm summarizing briefly, the drunken couple in front of us were asked to leave the plane before the flight began. I just wanna say, none of those people were actually on the mission team. Can I just be clear about that? They were, they were sat in front of Louise and I. I. I gotta tell you this, I know it's been a tough month for the airline, but the airline, you can tell, ask me who it is later, they handled it brilliantly. And I would say, well done. But the specialist assistant came in 
and he got the people talking. I mean, they were talking loudly, there was foul language, and he got them talking, and he just, he, I don't know how he did it, but those people talked themselves off the plane, which was a great relief to everybody. The final protest was a strange one. Well, the first one was, I'm an American, and so all of us were just sinking into our seats at that point. And uh, the second one was, uh, I'm an influencer and I'm gonna post it on Facebook. Please video this. And everybody sink, sunk even lower down into their seats at that point, so we all looked down. And um, you don't have to capture everything on phone, amen. And, and then they were gone and, and everyone was way too polite to applaud. Um, but it was a good feeling. <laughs> and I just wanna say this, we can influence in different ways. They were under the influence, obviously, of a particular substance at that point, and it would only have got worse, so that was a great decision by the airline, praise the Lord. But uh, they were under the influence, and of course, therefore, their, therefore their influence was not very good. And so it, it could be that we get under the wrong influence like that. Remember Ephesians 5, 18, do not be drunk on wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. It's important to make sure that our body is filled with the right things. But sometimes we can get influenced by an idea, we can get influenced by something that we heard. We can get influenced by our inner complaint or somebody else's complaint, and then we start to act out on that, and that's not a healthy thing to do. To be a living sacrifice and to have a renewed mind and to seek the will of God is to have this transforming work take place in our lives every day. And I need that, and Pastor Zeke reminded us that he needed that, we all need that renewal. Let's read on verse three, for by the grace, everyone say grace, given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought. I think that's very relevant to a sort of a high-performing community like this is. But rather, think of yourself with sober judgment. What does that mean? Well, I guess we, we see ourselves in the light of how God sees us. Forgiven, ransomed, redeemed, all those great things, but also a realistic knowledge of who we are and how we're doing in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you, so do not think of yourself more highly than you ought. Humility is a wonderful gift, it's one of my strong points. Come on, come on, just, no, I got a pastor friend, I got a pastor friend, and he, he goes like, he always says, uh, I'm known for my humility, he always says about, about himself, but uh, that's an old joke, I'm sorry about that, but it's like, uh, um, humility and, yeah, humility and how I achieved it, that's another one that, that uh, uh, jumps into mind there. We all want to blow our own trumpet, we can be so gifted that nobody else could possibly contribute to the situation like we could, and therefore we become the limiting factor for those around us as well. If there's one problem thinking too highly of ourselves, the other problem is sometimes thinking too lowly of ourselves. You remember Mo Moses, I was like, hey, why little old me, Lord? You know, why are you calling me to do this? They, I wonder which, one you, which category do you come into? Do you tend to be the one that goes like, hey, I'm no good, I could never do anything. Hey, there needs to be faith in what God can do in our lives. Are you the type that maybe you think like, hey, I'm omnicompetent, I can do everything, I'm awesome, I won't ask for a vote on this one. But we probably know which one we come into from time to time and Romans 12 addresses this. So what are we saying? First of all, surrender your body and renew your mind. Secondly, think and live as one body. Verse one to three is especially about the consecration of the Christian, and now verse four, we get into the action of what it's like on Promotion Sunday, if I could put it that way. As you go into your class, as we do all the stuff just on a Sunday morning, that's not the totality of church life by any means, and Wednesday night's a big deal, and that's not the totality of, of church by any means, but it's about, now we're gonna see the action, okay? Everyone's saying action. It's about the team. A lot of people have asked me about rugby because the USA did well in rugby sevens. And so you all have been asking me how to show the difference in the Olympics between rugby sevens and the 15s. And, and I tried to explain it so well and nobody even understood what I was talking about. But, uh, but, let me, but you can probably figure this one out. You can't win at rugby or soccer or basketball or volleyball or water polo or the rowing eights. You can't do that on your own. Or if you're running the relay, hey, everybody's gonna get fit. Everybody's gonna run hard and set off at the right time. The transition has to be good. If a leader just throws the, I call it the baton, but I know we all call the baton. If the, lead, if the leader just throws it or chucks it away, doesn't care about the next person 
Hey, that ain't very good for the church either. Don't just run your leg and not care about the next guy, although there are times we've got to just run our leg and then hand it over. Hand it over right and then take it. If, if somebody's given you an opportunity for Christian service and your answer is always, no, it's not my gift. No, it's not my gift. No, I haven't got the time. No, I was hurt in the past. It's like sometimes you, I tell you, to grow in the faith, you've got to take hold of that opportunity and run with what God has for you. Verse four, for just as each of us has one body. Do you have one body? Hello? Just as each of us has one body and with many members. Do you have, is there a bit more to your body than just a body, right? Here they are. Show me your fingers or your ears or whatever. Uh, just as, and these members do not all have the same function. So in Christ, we, though many form how how much body? One body, and each member belongs to all the others. And so after Jesus died and rose again and the Holy Spirit was poured out upon the church, what happened in the church? Well, you know, 3,000 people were baptized. Holy Spirit comes, 3,000 are baptized, and then the Bible says, and and even though it's broken up in a section in most Bibles and kind of, it's got a heading there, Verse 42 of Acts chapter two literally just says, and they devoted themselves. Like 3,000 were baptized and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, the breaking of bread, the fellowship and the prayer. The natural outflow of a relationship with Jesus was that the people acted as one body. And it was not about all the individual complaints or style or whatever it was. It was about different gifts, but one body and everybody playing their part in the fellowship of Jesus Christ. They were known for their generosity and they were, I'm sure, known for their humility too. They shared, they sacrificed, they sold fields, they sold cars. I, make that bit, I made that bit up. And we sometimes sing that song, I've heard you sing that, Michelle, and the church of Christ was born and the spirit lit the flame. And what did that lead to? A church on fire, a church that transformed the culture. In due course, the Roman Empire would fall The might of Rome would be nothing compared to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so we have many members and we are formed according to the leading of the Holy Spirit, each to play our own part. We're so glad this time of year, and actually we've had many visitors throughout the summer months, we're so glad to welcome our visitors. And if you are a visitor, I hope that you feel at home among us. We would love you to connect with a family group this morning as well. 88% of our worship Um, gathering is reflected in in our groups. It's very much who we are. And uh, there's a lot of prayer that goes on, a lot of connecting that goes on. We share the joys and sorrows of life. We study around God's word as well. So I wanna welcome our visitors and invite you to be part of the total experience. Worship is not just one thing for us. It's all the family groups. It's the whole thing. There's kids everywhere. It's a busy busy time. I love the corridors that are so uh, filled with so much joy. I love to walk out of the first service and go along that corridor and pop my head into some of the classes and see what's going on. And and so it's a joyous place to be. But visitors, I want to say this as well. I just encourage you to make sure that you don't stay in that waiting room. You may be seeking God and just like, hey, I've moved into the area. I need to find a new church. But you can't stay in that place of just being a visitor for too long. Never become a perpetual visitor and hanging in there for a while and then going on to the next thing. When we connect with the church, we need to sit under the ministry. We need to understand who the church is. But in time, we also need to serve. Otherwise, our serving muscles atrophy. And we've become like this. One screen shining bright, believing all the right stuff, but in reality, uh, pretty blank on the other side. So I want to encourage you to make sure you don't stay in that place for too long. We're a body, we're not a consumer church. Something has changed in us in the last four years. We've maybe had a little bit more of that in the past, but I thank God for a church that's all in. Can we show uh, the Lord our praise and thank him that we're being all in as a fellowship right now, everybody? Okay, last thing, third point. Play your, as we wrap up this uh, section, play your unique part chosen for you for the common good. Verse six, we have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. Different gifts, I'll say it again, not as a personal possession, but a gift from the Lord that glorifies God and edifies others. Your gifts don't belong to you, they are gifted for the glory of God. If someone gives you a birthday present or a Christmas gift, you don't go, uh, look at me. I deserve it. It's mine, all mine. But the first, most natural reaction is to say thank you. 
Something good has taken place here. Now, I would also say if someone gives you a gift and, and if someone already took some trouble to just select something that's gonna be really cool, really special, something that you can use in your life, and if that gift is just left to the side and it's never used, that can kind of be a little bit, oh, thank you very much, you know. But if that gift gets put to use, well, you've really demonstrated how much you value that gift. Now, how do I know my gifts? Hey, South Campus, I'm gonna be teaching who me at the South Campus on August the 21st on our Wednesday nights. And by the way, if you go to newhopebc.news, you can just go to What's Up Wednesday. There's a whole list of classes and we've just taken it to the next level. We're just uh, full on on this one. Now, the big challenge for us as a church, just so you all know, is that sometimes when the classes are that great for the adults, Sometimes that's a challenge for how we serve the under 18. So make sure if you're, if you're a regular volunteer that you just be sensitive to that as, as this season. But I'd love you to do that class. And part of that class, of course, is ultimately to make sure that we all know that we are able to live out this practically. So August the 21st here at the South Campus, I'm looking forward to getting to know a, a room full of people and to, to see how, what God is doing in our lives. Okay, let's read on with the rest, rest of these verses. It's your, if your gift, so you can even sign up today if you wanna do that newhopebc.news, I won't be offended if you go to your phone right now and do that. newhopebc.news, what's up Wednesday, scroll down. I think it's like the very last thing of the South Campus, the very last thing, and then you can just sign up. Um, so here we go, if your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. I just wanna say this about prophecy, that scripture is our foundation. Uh, everything we do must be biblical. Be careful not to say, thus saith the Lord. I don't think that's necessarily what this prophecy means. Uh, that was Isaiah, and that was Jeremiah. But make sure it is a true prophecy and not just an anger issue. Yeah, that was a joke as well. I think so, I've sometimes seen that outwork, that um, someone's just a little bit edgy and sometimes a bit feisty, and they call it prophecy. Well, not necessarily. I know the prophets could be a bit feisty sometimes, um, but they were surrendered to the, to the work of God. If it's serving, then serve. It's not, well, pastor, surely all of us are serving. Yes, all of us are called to serve, all right? Just say everybody, everybody say everybody. Everybody's called to serve, but clearly there is a kind of giftedness when some people are particularly good at serving. In fact, usually um, church people, when they see me doing my best to serve in a practical manner, they tend to sort of walk me away and just say, thank you very much for the effort and showing that you've got to be willing to do that, but you just do this over here, Pastor, because you're much better at that. And it's like, there are some people though who are really good at that stuff, and I'm always amazed at the abilities that God gives people. If it's teaching, then teach. I just wanna thank our teachers for teaching from zero to 18, teaching in your family group. I honor the family group leaders. Family group leaders usually share out the teaching a little bit as well. So can I just ask, if you're involved in any kind of teaching in that manner, and from an occasional teacher to a weekly teacher, would you put your hand in the air so we can just see you? Put your hand up high, don't be shy, that is awesome. Let's give God praise and thank God for those that do that. And pray for your pastor each week. Uh, pray for the Holy Spirit to, to speak. Pray for that holy moment when we come to the invitation each week. If it's to encourage, then give encouragement. One thing I've noticed about people with the gift of encouragement is that if they don't use the gift of encouragement, they get cynical. I just noticed that. If you know you've got a gift of encouragement, you've got to what? You've got to use it. The word says here, then give encouragement. Don't just think like, you know, if you get one of those nice thoughts about I need to text that person and just say, hey, I've been thinking about you and praying for you, well, follow through on that good thought. If you resist those thoughts, you say, oh, they don't wanna hear from me, then it's like you're not giving the encouragement that God wants you to give. If it's giving, then give generously. Again, everybody gives. We believe that the, ch the church is called to tithe and then to bring that extra gift, give that 10%. We started that at the beginning of the year, sort of, we sort of rejuvenated our vision of that. Our giving has been tremendous this year. Thank God for your faithfulness. And for those who've got the special gift of giving, can I just say what a difference that makes. If it is to lead, do it diligently. Let me comment about leadership. Those who are called to lead, let them lead. When some leadership occurs, it's very easy when we don't know all the facts or all the values, whatever, it's very easy to go, why didn't you do this? No one is beyond criticism but we can sometimes waste a lot of unnecessary energy. This is not a game, we're not playing, this is spiritual warfare. And so let the leaders lead, and I encourage our leaders, let's make sure that we lead. If it's to show mercy, there's one more here, if, there's, if it's to show mercy, how do we do it? Do it, like, grumpily, 
Do it like with a little bit of resentment. Do it like, is anybody gonna notice that I'm showing mercy here? No, we do it, you said it right, we do it cheerfully, which shows that when we're using our gifts, each one of those gifts, there is an exhortation to do it well, to do it right. If you're a leader, be diligent, leader. You gotta be prepared. You, you can't just show up. You can't just say, oops. You can't, like I just say, throw the bat on at, at somebody else. Do it diligently. If, you, if you've been given the task of showing mercy, then be cheerful. What a difference that makes. I want to summarize spiritual gifts from the book, Who Me, by saying this. Spiritual gifts are given as the Lord determines to believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. They are to glorify God and to edify or encourage believers. We are a body made up with many parts. Each part is vital, even the parts that seem to be unimpressive. But I wanna come back to the notion that if you have discovered your gifts, and if you have been deploying your gifts, and I encourage you to do that, but if you have discovered what they are, we still gotta be a living sacrifice. Knowing your gifts and deploying gifts is not some kind of shortcut to happiness, although I tell you what, your life goes much better when you serve in your area of passion. But we're still called to have our minds renewed, to be living sacrifices. We're called to seek, desire the will of God and to have a sober assessment of ourselves, a right assessment of ourselves. Okay, I've just finished a book. I can hear the humming of the music coming on there. I've just finished a, a book called When God Comes to Church by my friend Steve Gaines, pastor of Bellevue, Memphis. Actually, um, you guys, the Bowmans, were set under his ministry. He's a wonderful man, followed up uh, he followed actually maybe the greatest pastor in America, maybe the top two or three greatest pastors in America the last um, 100 years or so, Adrian Rogers. And actually we've got church members who sat under his ministry as well. But uh, Steve's not well right now, uh, but he's preaching faithfully, doing a great job. And this is what he said in this book, When God Comes to Church. You ready for this? Look this way, important couple of minutes. Jesus knows what's going on in my church and in yours. He walks through every room, office, corridor, and parking lot. He knows what's said in every class, every meeting, every counseling session, and every casual conversation. Dare we brag to one another when He is listening? Is there a spirit of prayer and humility or a spirit of pride and arrogance in your church? Is there consistency or hypocrisy? Is there genuine love or pretense? He knows the choir and the musicians. Do they sing for Jesus or to be heard by the congregation? Do they rejoice when someone else gets the solo or are they jealous? He knows every teacher of the church. Do they teach to glorify God by bringing lost people to Christ? Do they disciple believers to build them up in the Lord or to build up their own reputation as a faithful disciple maker? As church members, are they under the pastoral authority or do they have an independent spirit and a desire to do their own thing? Jesus knows every church and every church member. Can we stand together? He's aware of whether you come to church to be seen by others. I'll say it again. He's aware of whether you come to church to be seen by others or to meet with Him. Hey, I got one more minute of this. Let the Holy Spirit move in our hearts. Do you tithe and give offerings to the church just for a tax break? What if our government stops allowing church contributions to be tax deductible? That's how it is in most countries in the world and it truly is. Will you still obey the Lord and give at least 10% of your income to His church? What about missions? Do you go away on a mission trip a thousand miles away, but then come home and rarely share the gospel with anyone in your neighborhood? Do you look at porn online on Saturday night and go to church on Sunday and say, praise the Lord? By the way, one thing I, want, I do want to make a comment on that. I've noticed that if someone cannot worship, cannot sing, it's usually because in the house of the Lord, the Holy Spirit is convicting and bringing that thing. And so it's impossible to worship God. And you, you cannot lust and worship at the same time. Do you say you love other Christians, but tear them down and gossip behind their backs? And then Steve says, it's time for God to come back to church. Or well, we should put it the other way around, really, shouldn't we? It's time for God. It's time to look to Him.